Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel discussion here at Recon F Conference at MGM Grand in Title Shifting Cultures yeah, and Providing and Building a Diverse Workforce. Here we will discuss the importance of diversity and inclusion in real estate and construction and talk about how taking advantage of this concept could lead to better innovation and, and a satisfactory work culture. I go by the name of Akil Gerard Pyant. I will be a moderator for this panel. I'm an award recipient of the Top 100 Leaders of Real Estate and Construction Award and a managing, managing member of AI Capital LLC, an equity capital firm that acquires multifamily properties throughout the Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia metropolitan area, as well as the Carolinas. We offer above average returns to qualified investors that partner with us on institutional quality assets and also invest in emerging areas with value add opportunities. Before we get started with this discussion, we're gonna take a moment to introduce the brilliant professionals that will be our panelists for this session. So first, to my immediate left, your immediate right, uh, we have Mrs. Annie Macias Murphy. Ms. Annie Macias Murphy is a native of South Florida and was born and raised in Miami, Florida. She is currently the main qualifying agent for JA&M Developing Corporation, where she serves as the co-owner and its president. JA&M is a family-owned construction business that specializes in concrete and masonry work. In addition to her role as president of JA&M Development Corporation, Annie Macias Murphy is actively involved in several industry associations and in the local community. She serves on the legislative committee, co-chairs the membership committee, executive committee, treasurer, and board member for the South Florida chapter of Associated Builders and Contractors. JA&M Development Corporation has built the reputation on quality work, persistence, honesty, trust, and teamwork. Next, we have Mr. Colin pa McDowell. Since starting in the real estate industry, Colin has risen to become one of the most consistent award-winning agents for over 10 years. Colin began his career as an agent, then growing up, and then growing one of Coastal Virginia's best teams while simultaneously operating Greg Garrett Realty as the vice president. He continues to break the status quo by helping train, coach, and sell while never losing passion for people and true heart of service. At the heart of everything, at the heart of everything, Colin's wife, Nicole, and their two children, Mace, Madison and Riker, are his heart. Colin stays active as a parent while being a leader in the real estate industry and steadily involved in community programs such as Angel Tree, Keith Ivy Youth Empowerment Program, while continuing to search for more opportunities to make an impact. Next, we have Mrs. Latrice Slade. Mrs. Latrice Slade is the principal and founder of Slade Land Use, Environmental, and Transportation Planning, LLC, a 100% minority woman-owned general contracting and environmental services firm. She has a BA in political science, BA in communication studies, a master's in regional planning, and a JD from, the UNC, from UNC Chapel Hill. Mrs. Slade has experience in development and construction projects, her firm is licensed, her firm, excuse me, is a licensed general contractor in Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia, and South Carolina. Slade specializes in environmental services, geotechnical services, construction material testing, and urban planning. So Mrs. Slade is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and speaker. Last and certainly but not least, we have Mrs. Ronnie White. Ms. Ronnie White is also a fellow recipient of the Top 100 Leaders in Real Estate and Construction and serves as the Diversity Director, director for Habendum Real Estate in New York and is a resident of Manhattan. She is responsible for delivering development optimization of codified and underwriting specifications via building commissioning, contract interiors, FFE standards, CRE consultancy, and corporate art curation. She has many involvements that include public art quorum, safety and environmental committees, and also serves on the Solid Waste Advisory Board all in the New York area. So without further ado, we are gonna go ahead and go into the questions. How are you? How is everyone? Doing great, Doing excited to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, we're just gonna jump right into it. So, if, you know, if you, everybody could go around and tell me what made you get into the real estate and construction, in, construction industry? Like what really interested you to go into this industry? So I guess I'll jump right yeah. in. Sure. Um, some things are just part of your DNA. Yeah. And since uh, 
uh, my parents, when they first came here in 1969, my father, that was the first thing that he got, uh, that he started working was in construction. So I was exposed to it at a ver very early age. Mm -hmm. And summers while you're out doing a whole bunch of things, we were out there working and helping uh, our parents uh, in the construction. So even though all of us said, you know what, we want nothing to do with construction and we went and studied other things, slowly we kind of made our way back and the DNA called and right. that's what we got into. It's just an exciting line of work. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm always ladies first, so <laughs> ladies, I, I well, um, for me, it's funny. My mom um, used to joke and say that when I was like around four years old, I used to ask for all the trash was going to go after I left our house. And so um, she explained to me, because I'm from a rural area, we always carry our trash to a area where you go to a dump site. And so I wanted to know, well, where does it go from there? And then I wanted to know, why didn't it separate the trash? And so I was talking about recycling at a very young age before there was even recycling where I lived. And so... Um, I have always been interested in environmental. And so when I started my company, I started in the environmental space and then added on the general contracting and geotechnical material testing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I too uh, have um, always been involved uh, with some sort of rehab uh, when I was a little kid. Uh, me and my siblings, as you, um, most of you heard uh, this morning, uh, you know, we had to, instead of playing all summer or during spring break, we were rehabbing um, my, um, my family's like very modest uh, portfolio and uh, the, um, the, um, the properties were, were very old. Uh, so they had dirt cellars and we would find interesting things from the late 1800s there. And uh, so, and you know, went away from that. Um, moved to New York and worked on Wall Street and um, then had an opportunity to uh, work uh, with uh, certain individuals and uh, I honed in my eye and was exposed to uh, a world of luxury uh, interiors and worked on yachts and planes and castles and you know, really learned all about that, and uh, it was incredible. Um, and then uh, Wall Street called again, and um, this time it was uh, to solve major issues. So my first project was uh, 15 floors at 65,000 square feet to um, refresh, and uh, I wrote reports on uh, how uh, making uh, an interior envelope sustainable would save money and uh, helped with uh, REFM uh, mm -hmm. categories. And it led to projects all around the world and um, they got bigger and then that led me to uh, work with uh, investors in commercial real estate. So I do a little bit of all that still. <laughs> well, I can't even uh, imagine this. I, <laughs> My story is, is simple. I, I was actually a, a young guy. I grew up in Newport News, Virginia. I probably knew nothing about what I wanted to do, I, except for cause trouble, clearly, uh, from my track record and history as a young child. But then I moved to LA with a good friend of mine, lived in LA for about five years. Mom started to get a little sick since my dad had passed when I was young. I moved back to Virginia, not knowing what I was gonna do. And uh, a friend of mine that lived in LA, his dad was a local real estate guru. Um, the guy actually owned a Century 21 Nackman, or not Nackman, Century 21 uh, franchise that was the highest production, per person production office in all Century 21 through the 80s and early 90s. Mm -hmm. Then he got out of it and it came to Greg Garrett Realty and now it's Garrett Realty Partners. So he had actually put me on the phone with him, had me talking and convinced me that this was a career I should try. Though I was 24 years old, uh, I knew nothing about real estate, didn't even want to be in it. And uh, I thought it literally was for older women and retirees and military. So I'm like, what does a 24 year old kid know about real estate? But he convinced me on two things. You can make as much or as little as you want and you could be your own boss. And those two things appealed for me because I had no skill sets. I barely passed high school and I never went to college. So I'm like, let me give it a go. And here I am now talking with everyone of y'all. So it's cool. Okay. 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for telling us, you know, what made you want to come into the real estate and construction industry. So now that we know a little bit more about you, let's dive into the next question. So with everything that happened last year um, in 2020, um, you s we see that a lot of different industries across the board, not just real estate and construction, um, but are beginning to focus on diversity and inclusion more than ever before. I mean, it didn't matter what political affiliation you were with. It didn't matter who you were with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything going on. You saw that a lot of industries were saying, we need to focus on diversity and inclusion. So in your opinion, why is diversity and inclusion important to you? And how are you encouraging diversity and inclusion in yourself and in your company? Anybody can answer. We don't have to go in order. Just or unless anybody want to go first. I'll, I'll go. Um, so I've been blessed to have opportunities to serve as a general contractor on different contracts for clients that are corporations. And oftentimes, you know, my whole team of subcontractors are also minorities. And so with that, they get the credit that they're looking for when it comes to diverse spend. And so for me, it's natural. You know, it's not hard for me to find other diverse companies. Um, I am a member of different organizations such as NABWIC and NAWIC and, and things like that where we try to network and pull resources together. And so being in those kind of professional organizations, you get to know people and you work together. And so I'd like to see more of that. It's just a natural kind of um, interconnection of people. Ladies? I guess for me, <laughs> yes. I guess for me, it's just, uh, it just goes back. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And it's just a very um, natural flow. Whoever is uh, best for the, the position as far as a subcontractor and um, I think it's at least for me and and I think I uh, we, we can attest it's it's easy for us to uh, at least to be inclusive because it's just it's it's an open door uh, policy if you will uh, that it's it's really um, where I'm also uh, I've also spoken for NABWIC in the past um, different uh, things that they had in South Florida uh, especially with uh, the young people and um, uh, students that typically uh, don't have exposure to uh, to all the opportunities that that maybe other students may. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess trying to be in different places, different opportunities that uh, one can speak at and uh, expose uh, young people to that otherwise they they wouldn't, and being able to hire them in the future as well in the, in that capacity in other capacities is just a being able to, to bring folks on board. Um, yeah, you know, I've, uh, I too have um, been blessed with uh, just uh, having an opportunity uh, based on uh, just the, my skills and, and the value that I could add to a project. And, uh, and I think that um, you know, now you see just more visibility um, due to technology, you know, Zoom and uh, people uh, can see other people more uh, in various venues uh, through uh, social media and, and whatnot. And I, I think that, um, you know, uh, some people may have been unaware of uh, certain inequities and or, um, weren't uh, uh, able to uh, approach or, or, or uh, make some sort of connection. And uh, now that seems to be uh, possible. Uh, I mean, for me, I, I grew up with uh, parents that basically came from two different ends of the spectrum. One was from New York and one was from Georgia. Mm -hmm. And they both related on a, in a common sense that everybody's human. So I grew up with that. And my family situation was more than just blood. It was friends of the family. And so it was always diverse. But I do think the real estate industry and all industries are, are pushing diversity because it's the right thing. It's human. That's what we all are. We all bleed red, right? We, we sit here and it's easy for us to sit up and talk about it, but the real work's done on the ground floor when we're sitting in our companies and we're listening to our employees that have different exposures, right? We're listening to other contractors and people we work with and what are their exposures and trying to find that common ground starts that conversation, but that's the baseline of the work in my opinion. And I think in, in our company, what we focused on 
particularly is bringing in a unique circumstance. Like we have a growth coach, which we're real estate companies, as we know, don't generally have that. But we have the top tier growth coach you could ever ask for. Her name's Albion Lyons. She is by far the most genius person you could ever ask for because she has her own NPR radio show. She has her own businesses. She doesn't really need to do this, but because she is empowered to empower people and then help companies build diversity, the, the CEO of our company brought her in and she fit in and changed the mold of where we were going. We've got people from 92 years old that's a colonel working for us to an 18 year old, different languages and cultures, and that was done on purpose to say, hey, we hear you, now let's actually do some real work about it. Right, so. I can, sure. I can add to that uh, with the work that I uh, have been doing on uh, various boards and committees. Uh, we definitely find uh, strength in that very uh, type of scenario. We have um, people in their 90s. We have uh, very young people, uh, all, all, all backgrounds. And, um, you know, we uh, find... Uh, a strength and, and coming together with a, a common cause. And um, it really makes for a, a powerful and dynamic uh, a group uh, that causes, you know, force for change. And, uh, you know, and with that, uh, the seniors uh, with, um, you know, with uh, no computer experience, and then you have the millennials, uh, it's all about engagement. and. Uh, so now, you know, the, they communicate and, and instead of having uh, a fixed mindset, uh, will uh, just uh, be open and uh, ask questions. And so now we have uh, many of our seniors that are very tech savvy and uh, the others uh, who may be younger are, you know, they definitely uh, gain wisdom and uh, you know, uh, especially on, on some of the committees, there are things where we don't have to reinvent the wheel because, you know, it's something that uh, had come up even uh, like a few years ago, but sometimes it goes back, you know, 10, 20 years and they say, oh, remember when this happened? And uh, so it's like a shortcut. It's really, uh, it's been tremendous. So, so in y your opinion, do you believe that the real estate and construction industry is progressing in their diversity and inclusion efforts? Or do you believe that we still have more work to do? I believe we have a lot more work to do. Um, I think that it is still very competitive in the construction industry because oftentimes people are looking for the lowest bid. Sometimes they're looking for the most responsible bid, you know, which is different from the lowest bid. Uh, but there are more challenges, I think, for disadvantaged businesses, um, even when you compare them to small businesses. I think that you have to be intentional about bringing more disadvantaged businesses to the table, um, even if it's carving out different scopes with offering tier two opportunity. I think that you have to be intentional. Um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You can't expect a disadvantaged business to be able to bid the same way as a larger business that has more capital and revenue that can float projects longer. Because as you know, in the construction industry, you have to pay people you know, every two weeks. And depending on that payroll, that may knock you out of even being able to bid on the project. So we have to be realistic about growing disadvantaged businesses um, to be able to be more competitive by matching those larger problems with the smaller businesses. Um, to add to Latrice's point, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a uh, certified W uh, MBA, MBE um, business concern, and uh, with you know, and I have uh, several um, government and uh, local contracts, um, and uh, there is issues with that. Uh, luckily, uh, things are changing, and there's a lot to go, but. Um, I think that there is um, a, a real effort uh, to uh, to raise uh, to uh, mitigate some of the uh, inequalities, um, and that could be uh, you will see examples of uh, percentages of MWBEs uh, for, uh, encouraged to participate uh, in projects uh, increase. Um, 
mentorship uh, between uh, peer uh, companies and uh, also um, literacy and education to make sure that uh, MW MBE is um, correctly set up and uh, that they have uh, the proper uh, tools and, and uh, you know, financial literacy uh, that's essential uh, for a, uh, for a, a successful business. So in South Florida, what I've uh, noticed just, um, I would say probably in the last 10 years, uh, definitely more uh, women in uh, the higher managerial roles, like as uh, project managers, uh, um, higher executives. So I have seen a, a growth in that area, in, at least in the construction sector in South Florida. Okay. Uh, I would say we, we got a lot more work to do, for sure. I, I have seen the changes. You know, I hopped in at 24, like I said, at that time, if you could look back, which was 2008, one month for that bomb dropped, I hopped in at 24, naive. And even though I knew that, now I'm seeing younger people, all different colors, cultures, nationalities, languages, you're watching them get into this industry. So it's, some of it's natural, right? Mm -hmm. But some of it is from, in my opinion, the internet, right? It opened up the world to so many of us that were had a narrow viewpoint. We were local, we were all local. And then we opened up to the world and now we could share our thoughts with other folks. And so that exposed a lot of people to different cultures, different understandings and languages but then we did nothing with it but try to get entertained like TikTok or some of these other things. And right. then some of us got very progressive and used it for the betterment. And I think we still have that more work to do. We can utilize those tools. But again, I, I go back to the same statement, ground level. You have to purposely look at, at what you're doing in your companies, what you're doing with your everyday consumers and how are you sending that message? How are you listening more than you're talking? Because that's what it's gonna take. Because a lot of people haven't been listening in my opinion for years because some of these problems have existed far before I was even on this earth. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Uh, actually, yeah, definitely to your point, um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, mindsets and uh, that uh, people have, have changed and uh, people, like you said, because of uh, technology and uh, just being able to access uh, the world uh, from, you know, your home, um, uh, people have uh, uh, evolved, uh, you know, on, on many issues. We're beginning to go back to, well, hate to bring up bad memories, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to talk about 2020 again. Um, so everybody's saying, you know, in President of Times, we're going back to a new normal now. Um, now that all the vaccines are coming out, you know, a lot of offices are trying to get back. If they're not back in the office, they're trying to get back by Labor Day, et cetera, et cetera. As it pertains to this particular panel, in your perspective, would you say that real estate and the, would you say that there's been an increase, excuse me, in diversity and inclusion efforts since COVID? Do you believe that COVID has affected the efforts of diversity and inclusion? And so why? Um, I, I can speak to that. I am, um, my company is an environmental company as well as general contracting. And I, um, one of my friends shared an article with me from the Los Angeles Times saying that there's COVID-19.2 um, that just hit California. And so, you know, yesterday I said, you know, I don't think that the pandemic we just went through is gonna be the last pandemic we ever experienced. So with that said, we have to be prepared for our businesses to survive in any type of climate. I'm very proud that our government stepped up to help us with PPE money and things like that to help in EDL loans. But at the end of the day, we now, have to begin to pay back loans. Right. So if your business was at a certain point before the pandemic started, now your business is once again thriving where it used to be, but now you have to pay back the loans, that's an added stress to business, right? And now you're also looking at COVID-19.2. Are you ready? What does that mean for us? Are we prepared? Um, one of the things that my business has done is we created a website, slavesafety.com, and we're offering cleaning services that are approved by the CDC and EPA guidelines, but we're also doing facility tests where we can show you within 15 minutes after doing a swab analysis whether COVID-19 is present, and then clean it. But the great thing that we're offering is 
training for your janitorial staff. Once we do that high level environmental cleaning, how do you maintain that? Um, we're offering selling products such as virus defender to ionize bacteria, plexiglass to be able to still collaborate with people. But if someone sneezes, you don't have to say, hit the deck, oh my God, is it a COVID, you know, call for a sneeze, whatever. Right. So we're thinking outside the box, even if, um, from a development standpoint, how we construct our buildings and do space planning. So all of this, just by 2020, you know, has changed my business because I've never even sold products before. Now I have a website selling products. Right, right. Well, I'm uh, actually the uh, chair of uh, Health and Hospitals Corporation um, Hospital uh, Bellevue. And, um, you know, uh, on several points there, uh, you know, Bellevue is where the first nursing school in the United States was established. That's where the first ambulance service was established back before no one here would even remember. Even the oldest person that you know wasn't around. Um, and it's also where Ebola was stopped from spreading in this country. Um, and so, you know, uh, and yesterday, you know, during the last break, I actually was on our um, board um, uh, uh, meeting and, you know, uh, we were speaking uh, with uh, several of uh, the lead doctors, uh, and you know we, we keep up on, on what's going on. Uh, many of the people that you see on the national news, uh, they, they come from Bellevue. Uh, it, it's just a, a place of incredible expertise, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just thrilled that I'm part of that. And again, that's a, a place where we have a wonderful, diverse uh, board. But um, what, uh, you know, that's it's important to uh, keep informed. Uh, I've seen from the very beginning of COVID, um, we had a uh, legislative breakfast uh, with Dr. Osiris Barbo uh, telling us what it was all about, and we were probably one of the first audiences to get that information, and you know. Uh, uh, one of the things that we had at the legislative breakfast was uh, goodie bags that had uh, a mask and uh, Purell in it for all of the all of the attendees, um, and we were social distance. Uh, basically, a week later, the entire country uh, went into lockdown, um, and you know, I um, I was. Uh, very, very uh, busy from the very beginning. Uh, I had uh, some large uh, clients uh, down on Wall Street and, and in Midtown, uh, frankly calling me. And so I uh, developed, because of my background with uh, materials and uh, sustainability, uh, you know, and, and with the committees, part of that is you know, uh, and designing healthcare facilities. You know, I, I knew to look for, um, you know, uh, powder coated services that had uh, silver in, in the paint or uh, fabrics that had silver enmeshed in the fabric uh, to mitigate any sort of uh, bacteria uh, and uh, to, uh, you know, make a, a, for a cleaner environment. Uh, to, uh, for uh, to mitigate uh, infection, uh, so they were calling me and uh, immediately went to uh, changing doors, so you don't have to, uh, you know, touch a handle. Uh, went to sliding doors um, and created a new uh, blueprint, which most of you have seen. That's uh, a, a distance uh, works. Uh, area um, at the time, uh, benching systems, which are like uh, tables very much like this, where was very much in vogue for, uh, you know, workers, uh, got rid of that because that was just not going to work. And uh, bought and changed uh, a lot of the, um, like cafeterias, uh, so, uh, I know that earlier, uh, you know, many of the uh, panelists were speaking about 
um, reducing uh, size reduction. And I actually, uh, you know, uh, did some of that, but like for a cafeteria, I made it much larger and uh, so that there would be uh, room for um, egress uh, and, uh, you know, got rid of uh, many of the uh, reception areas and converted those to um, areas where a uh, worker's uh, like a laptop or keyboard and mouse uh, were uh, placed in a dedicated uh, uh, slot and uh, used, uh, uh, you know, uh, some sort of like a, if you will, like an ultraviolet light to uh, kill any viruses or germs on, you know, um, on the surfaces, and they would just uh, pick it up, uh, you know, when they were scheduled to work. Uh, so I was busy doing that the entire time. Uh, that slowed down and then, of course, uh, uh, shifted to uh, working remotely. And, you know, I, again, uh, because of that, was able to see a lot more uh, diverse uh, faces, than a, a face with a name, per se. And uh, so visibility uh, in diversity is, is very key. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I have said, I would say that it's changed and, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it shows that with the incredible amount of deaths and the way that people have shifted to uh, working remotely as a norm, um, you're going to see that that's how uh, COVID has uh, affected things and it's, it's here to stay. There, there is a new uh, variant that is scaring people and, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, and that's why I'm wearing a mask. I'm fully vaccinated, but because I'm the chair, I'm modeling behavior. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that's why I'm, I'm wearing it because uh, you, that's my responsibility. Awesome. That's all right. Due, due to time constraints, we, we're gonna have to go <laughs> on to the next question. Um, what is the challenge you see being a minority in, in this business? Um, I mean, are, what are the advantages and disadvantages w that you would say in terms of being a minority within um, the real estate industry and the construction industry? Well, I think initially, a lot of it is uh, the cash flow, mm -hmm. right? And um, a lot of things, I think there's the, the statement, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Right. So, um, as you start navigating and, and uh, becoming involved in uh, trade associations and things like that and start networking and have certain conversations, then you start picking up on different things. Mm -hmm. But others that may know a little bit more, the, the how should I say, the, the, the learn, learning curve mm -hmm. is not as long. Right, right, right. Uh, I, I think it's hard for me to be a minority in any situation in America. So, I mean, just answering honestly, I, I will go back to the question you had before. Uh, COVID did change people, mm -hmm. right? It, it gave us all an experience together. The whole world was in this experience. We saw the human element. So it did progress diversity because it allowed us to see the value of life in a different lens. We didn't have to go to a funeral to figure that out, right? We didn't have to lose somebody. We, we had to lose a lot. We had to lose people, watch people pass away, but we also had to be confined not see our friends, not see our family. So, of course, businesses adapted, try to stay safe, the ones that could stay open. That encouraged that. And I think organically, that's only gonna get better because I think we're all awake to the fact that you're right, we could have another pandemic. This came out of the blue. If we're not prepared, we don't stay ready, we don't help our folks out, we don't listen, we won't be there, right. right? We'll go right back to where we were. And I don't think any of us wanna be there. So we're, we're all gonna march forward and I, I have, huge faith in humanity. And I know that's hard in, in times like these, but I absolutely have a huge faith in humanity. Right, right. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, kudos to all the businesses that are here today that survived COVID. Um, because I tell you, I've never worked as hard. Um, with my 15 years of being in business, with having to be more savvy, more nimble, um, more proactive, but also more compassionate um, with my employees and being understanding. Um, it's the true test of leadership. 
I, I do want to say that, you know, when you think of construction, you would not necessarily think of my face initially. Um, and one of the things that I've been told, I am um, from North Carolina, I now live in Alabama, and I've been told that I'm the most polite, aggressive female they've ever met. And so I take that with a badge of honor, right? Nothing wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with that. But I will speak up and let people know that I exist, that I do want to seat at the table. And, you know, since I've been able to develop relationships, friendships, you know, I've had to, you know, let my friends know that may have not even thought about me being at the table that, hey, that table has everyone that looks alike and there's nobody in mm -hmm. our age group, there's no one of color. Mm -hmm. I like a seat too, you right. know? And, and with that, um, people have been open. And so I think that's great. But I think that you have to be comfortable in your own skin. And one of the things that I've learned is, you know, march to your own drum. And I encourage females, you know, don't go trying to break glass ceilings because it sounds good, right? Because there's so many sacrifices that you may make in order to break those glass ceilings. If it, that is your calling on your life to break those glass ceilings, then go for it. But march to your own drum, be comfortable in your own skin, no matter what seat you're sitting at the table and who's sitting around, you have a voice, use your voice to uplift other people, not just yourself, because if I'm sitting at this table, I'm not just representing Latrice Slate, right? I'm representing so many other people who didn't have a chance to be at the table. How do I prepare for that? Um, I never wanted to be like the dog running behind the car, and then once the dog got in the car, how do you drive it? Right. So, you know, I've been preparing for many, many years for these opportunities. Right. And so, do I feel entitled? Yes, I do. Because I've been preparing and doing my exercises every day. Right. So it's, it's time for us to all come together and sit around the table together and uplift one another. Right, right. Yeah, definitely to add to uh, Colin and Latrice's point, um, I, as a um, minority business owner, I believe that it's important uh, to uh, have a, a strong business. So uh, make sure that you uh, have your business set up correctly um, and that you um, uh, have uh, financial literacy to make it grow. Uh, have some sort of, um, uh, you know, proper setup, uh, safety net. Uh, make sure you have uh, the proper insurance and that you are planning for uh, the long haul and, and you know, maybe a, as, a, as a legacy uh, type uh, company. Uh, I remember starting and uh, people thinking that, you know, I wasn't there for the meeting. They were waiting for somebody else. And, you know, uh, you know luckily uh, that's uh, beginning, uh, that has changed. Right, right, right. Um, you know, just to kind of piggyback on that, yeah, I mean, being a minority in the business, I'm, I'm 25 years old, I'm an African-American man. You, like you said, I think, Andy, you don't know what you don't know. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those conversations where now, at least in the African-American community, we're having more conversations of generational wealth, commercial real estate. Uh, you know, the guys around me, the women around me are starting to become more interested in this industry. I think that's kind of how I'm seeing uh, diversity and inclusion in, in real estate and also construction. So with that being said, I want to dive a little bit, a little bit further. I mean, does access to capital, does access to, you know, resources, information affect some groups more than others, uh, in your opinion, in, as it pertains to real estate and construction? Uh, Tim, yeah. you want me to? You can go, uh, anybody. Hey. Yep. I, I mean, of course, it's access to information, but I think this Knowledge. does us a lot of good. Yep. It, before, it was hard, right? right? You had to go to a library, read a book, how, how good is that? I still read, I'm a nerd, but I did not even want to read when I was young, you know? Right. Right. But I love soaking in knowledge, and I love learning from other folks like y'all, uh, like people out here, mm -hmm. right? I like, I think the idea is the, the information is accessible, but then who's there to point you in the direction? Right. Who's gonna open their arms, lift you up, and say, hey, this is what I learned. Let me share my narrative with you. Let me go ahead and give you some pointers and point you in the right direction. You still got to do the work. Mm -hmm. We all had to do the work. Right. But if, if we can fix the information, since we have the tools, 
and get more access, I definitely think you're going to start, again, another layer of fixing the diversity issue because definitely there are lower income areas that may not know to utilize this for this. And they may be looking at YouTube too much, TikTok too much, and spending too much time getting entertained rather than getting educated mm -hmm. and get educated. And I think that's going to be the key to this. I would say uh, my business has been around since 2006. And I, you read my bio. Um, I have four degrees from UNC Chapel Hill, but by far the last over 15 years, I have felt like I've been in college still. Um, it has been a constant learning experience. And so fortunately, I'm a lifelong learner and I enjoy to learn and I enjoy going to conferences and seminars and you know, it's great now that you can actually, you know, look at things online. Mm -hmm. People are making it more accessible that you can be a part. Um, but I would say, you know, being an entrepreneur is definitely not for the faint at heart. And you have to be willing to go where other people may not want to go, work when other people don't want to work. Um, when we talk about digging deep, uh, that's just the nature of what we do. Um, and I do think it's part of all of our DNA, right? Yeah, definitely. And so what we have to do is continue to be open to share information. And so that's one of the things that I definitely am looking forward to today is sharing information with other people. Okay. Game is free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, had uh, unfortunately not uh, had the benefit of having a, uh, a proper mentor, and uh, I knew that it would just take that much more uh, for me to do what I, what I uh, needed, to find what I needed to learn. Uh, so yes, being a lifelong uh, learner, uh, and also with the industry, there's always, uh, with construction and real estate, there's innovation, there's uh, new ways, there's um, all this newness. Keep up on that. Uh, keep up with your certifications. Uh, and uh, that just uh, strengthens uh, your, your ability. Uh, and so uh, education uh, is key and um, just you know, keeping current and engaging to uh, stay current amongst uh, your uh, peers and colleagues. Okay. What would you say is the future of diversity and inclusion in real estate and construction. If you, if you could summarize in a couple sentences or more what you believe the future of diversity and inclusion in real estate and construction is, what would that be? Are you talking idealism or are you talking like with a crystal ball? <laughs> Any, anything. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you want it short, sweet, and to the point, I think it, again, is getting the information out there to where people can find their passion. I mean, as we heard everybody's stories and we've listened to other people speak at this convention, you can hear that most people did not have this as a desired field, right? But somewhere along the way, somebody introduced them to the idea again, gave them the information. I think the more that we can get out the information, what we're doing and share that, I, I'm, I'm confident that will be where you'll see the whole world open up and see the possibilities. And they'll find their passion in our career fields, whether it's an engineer, right, or a, a builder, or whether it's a plumber, or whether it's a, you know, investment firm. They will find their passion. They will find their problem to solve. And you will have the human element that looks all different involved with it, where you won't just look at a career any longer as, well, that's for this type of person. No, it'll be for you, too, if you love it. You just got to go work for it. That's my feeling. What I mentioned as far as what the, the landscape of how I've seen it in the last 10 years, I just see, I just see that it's going to continually grow. And um, everything that everyone's on the panel has said, especially, you know, as, as I hear, you know, uh, your own voice, be true to your yourself, to who you are, you know, don't, don't uh, I think today also her, you know, one person's journey is not a, a, another one's. Uh, there's similarities, but it, it is beating to your own drum. And it is, uh, you know, we, we are all uh, leaders and innovators and uh, folks uh, follow behind us. And, and what path are we leading? Mm -hmm. You know, with what are we leading? We lead by example. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, you know, as you know, the brown population 
um, soon will not be the minority um, in America. And so I want to say that what we need to do at this point is make sure that we're all leaving a legacy behind. Um, when I started my business, I started with $500 on unemployment. And so I poured the money back into my firm to grow my firm to where it is. Well, for my nieces and nephews, I want to make it easier for them to be able to do whatever they want to as well, to have a platform. And so, you know, many of us started in the real estate construction business, not with a lot of money and not with a lot of resources. But think about if we would have had more resources. Right. Where would we be if we had, you know, more money to invest in our firms and not starting on unemployment, but starting further down the road? We're already not as far as some other group. How do we make sure that our loved ones can be up here, not back here? So I think that we have to plan for that. We have to make investments. Like we talk about buying real estate. Even though I'm a general contractor, well, I also want to buy properties and invest. And one day I want to want to retire and I want checks coming in. Well, I'm not working on a project, right? We have to be forward thinking. And, and so I'm hoping that our generation will lay the foundation so the next generation will have um, further along that they can start at a starting point and not back here. That's, that's what I'm hoping it will look like. I definitely agree. I think the uh, the future is, is bright. Um, you know, I just if you think about it, uh, when I was a little kid, uh, my dad had a, a calculator that was gigantic, and you know, it was it couldn't touch it, and and all of that. And now, you know, the, those same functionalities are on everyone's phone. Uh, and before that, there was a slide rule. And, and earlier in the in, uh, the presentations, we heard about um, BIM. When I was learning AutoCAD, I had to I learned by having to actually type in the commands in the command line. Now everything is uh, icons. Uh, so you know uh, things move forward. And um, just like Colin said, you have uh, these. Uh, different uh, professions, and there's an intersectionality uh, through uh, technology um, where uh, people can develop and new things will emerge and, you know, new opportunities. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So uh, instead of doing a typical question and answer, uh, we're going to do something a little bit differently. So in the spirit of inclusion, uh, we would like for some people to share at least one fact that will help other people's businesses. So you, you came to Recon F, it, we're in Las Vegas, we want to make sure that we leave empowered, right? So if, if we can pass the mic around a little bit, if you, anybody could give maybe one fact that could help other people's businesses, we'd start, you know, for example, I'll, with I'll one of the pen. Example. Give an um, example. So one of the things that I'm, it's, it's a funny story. Um, I test concrete, grout, mortar soil, asphalt. I'm the, I'm the person that touches things that most people don't want to touch. So I used to go to construction sites and I had a, a car, which was not appropriate. And so when I was able to get my first truck, I wanted an SUV, not, um, not a pickup truck. Um, my workers have pickup trucks, but I don't want to drive a pickup truck. And so when I found out that I could receive a $25,000 um, tax reduction off my taxes by having a vehicle over a certain amount of weight, I was really excited. So that's how I was able to get my SUV for myself. And so, you know, that's something I didn't know when Annie was talking about sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, well, that reduced my, my tax bracket for me. And that was a big deal. And so, you know, I'm interested in knowing what other people in the audience may know to help other businesses that is common knowledge to some people, but it's not common knowledge to everybody else in the room. So if you have something that you would like to share, you know, I, I definitely want to know. I mean, that, that's value add. We all come to conferences for value add, right? To gain information, to gain knowledge. And so this is a point where we all can share what we know. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a tip, and I would say it's been the strongest driving force in my life is to, to realize that, again, that human element, find people and sit down, sit down. Have a conversation. Get to know them. Really get to know them. Every person's got a unique story. Listen to the story. You'll start to build a relationship, if you're truly listening, that can feed your business 
can help you find the knowledge, can do a lot of things that would increase our diversity. And I think if we spent more time investing in the personal capital instead of the physical money capital, mm -hmm. we'd all be a whole lot richer and we wouldn't have to work nearly as hard. It'd be a whole lot less stressful. That's what I've learned. It's something that I could give to everybody. Perfect. We're, we're going to move on to the audience. I think we had a couple of people. Yes. So um, one thing that I feel that can help a lot of companies is the efficiency at which the company grows and scales. For instance, new hire training is uh, very vital to ensuring that the processes and procedures are kept uh, throughout the company's progress and bringing on the new staff and training them in a timely manner and training on the job. For my company, we do this by video training so that they can watch videos that go through the process and they can work on a project that is similar to that video so they can work on the job and learn on the job. That's a one thing that I've seen and I've seen that virtual reality mixed with that is something that is coming up in the future and some people are taking advantage of that. Do you have any insight to efficiency and training of new staff members during scaling prop? Uh, are you asking the question? Or are you making the statement? I'm making a statement. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I'm making a statement and uh, asking a, a question uh, uh, because uh, you asked for us to uh, help benefit other companies. No, I love it. I mean, it, that was hugely insightful, especially when it comes down to we all started as a small business, right? And then at some point we realized we were getting pretty good and then it had to scale or, you know, eventually it could implode. So I think that's valuable. I would say, you know, at, at our company, we're constantly trying to move ahead and use technology as an asset, as an assistant, as an ally, not as the thing that's going to replace our folks. You know, we get outside of the box, but we listen to our folks, listen to our consumer, because at, at our business, we look at it in two ways, right? Our consumer are the buyers and sellers we're trying to service, but we also have another consumer. It's our agents. It's our staff. So how do we provide both with a level playing field to communicate? And that training has to be somewhat experiential, right? You're going to have to learn hands-on on the job. But how do you give that, like what you're talking about with video? So what we started with was a three-month intensive program, and then we would do role-playing. We realized role-playing didn't work, and we also needed to get faster at training because they would lose dollars. So we trimmed it down to three weeks. And then we got down nuts and bolts, continued that. But then we realized that wasn't good enough because most people starting in real estate are what? Part-time. They have a full-time job, want to transfer in. So now we're developing a, techno a technology background or a platform that they can go in. It's still taught in person or live online, but they can get the material anytime they want. And then we're getting them leads so that they actually are experiencing live people. So we spend a lot of money on providing things like Zillow, Truly, or Realtor.com leads to those agents who never have ever been in this industry so they can learn on the job. Does it cost us money as a company? Absolutely. How many leads do we lose to an ex inexperienced person? But at the end, you're building them up and you're investing in the human capital. So the money will come later. That's what we're doing. Perfect. I think we had another person. Hi, Roman. So I just wanted to say in the spirit of sharing information, and it seems like we're, there's a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners in this room. Um, about two years ago, we implemented a system called EOS, an entrepreneurial operating system, and that changed our business. And um, you know, it's just, it's just a system that you implement. It's not like a software or anything. So that's my recommendation to the group. So I'll follow up on that real quick and we're not together. Um, but my, my experience, um, the best value that I got and the most success that my company got was just from hire, just for hiring the right people. And when you sit down with somebody, you know whether or not they're the right person. Um, we're, we're a contracting company. Two of the best hires I ever made came from Wells Fargo Bank in marketing, and you know ended up being a construction project manager. It was amazing. And you know hiring, training. I, I would also reference coaching as opposed to training because the right people are going to do the research. They're going to train themselves, and 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 they get a reward you know they're the right people because they get as much reward from the checks that they get as from growing and expanding as a person. Uh, and, and so, you know, finding the right people and, and helping them foster and improve their own personal development has, has always helped me, you know, grow 
and, and find success in, in just a deeper way. I love it. That's actually our attitude is aptitude over, yeah, or it's attitude over aptitude when we're sitting down with a new hire. You could shove a resume in our face that resume doesn't matter. It is what's your personality, who are you as a person, are you a fit for the company culture that we fit in, and then we'll train you on the rest and help you along the way and support you. So I agree with that. That's awesome. Perfect. I think we have time for like one or two more, I think. Okay. So I have the mic. Uh, 401k robs, rollover for business startups. If you have a 401k from a prior employer, you can roll it into a C-corp that you start and own without any tax consequences. There's no early withdrawal fees. There's no taxes on that money. So dollar for dollar, what you had in your 401k, you can then buy real estate with, for example. And I'm on the construction side, but uh, it's a way to get access to your money that you've earned and collect it and put it to work for yourself rather than investing in other companies like just stocks that you're buying, right? Very cool. And actually, to, to add to that point, that's an excellent point. Uh, if you are growing and you're trying to attract uh, the right talent, uh, get key personnel insurance. And that could be uh, very key in hiring somebody uh, with that would be lucrative and, and it, that shows potential and loyalty to the company. Perfect. All right, one more. Um, write the story. As we move into the IT era, you know you want to automate all of your processes. In order not to waste time, you have to write the story from A through Z. So as I'm working with smart property um, systems, because they're creating a software for us, the coding talk is they have to write the story as they're coding this software. And it changed all of my processes because I had to write each process out step by step. But that prevented me from getting software that I don't need or don't work and having to add all these APIs to my software and spending more money because I'm paying four or five people to add to my software. So in order to not make those mistakes, write the story from A through Z and A has steps. B has steps. C has steps. Write the story before you get into a software as you move into the IT and automated area era. Very awesome, cool. awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you panelists. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for coming. Um, this has been a really good thank you. <laughs> and that concludes today's uh, that concludes today. <laughs> thank you so very much. <laughs>